This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Hello. It's certainly flipping well is Partners in Crime with us. It is. Hello, Bob. Hello, hail fellow, hello. well met. Yes, well, I was going to say happy Friday, happy Wednesday, as we are. Yes, posing yeah, as Friday, the, probably. Yeah, we're it, always no, posing as Friday. Yes. We're always a, a couple of days earlier than we, we say we are, because we're, we're cheeky little monkeys like that. Yes, well, absolutely. Well, you're a particularly cheeky little monkey this week. Uh, I walked in, and it was very clear that uh, my learned colleague here had wonky settings. Mm. I said, what's the matter with you? He says, I've got wonky settings. I said, well, sit yourself down. He said, no, I've got to get all the lighting done and I've got to get all the things done. So we've just spent the last 25 minutes, a good part of the last 25 minutes, getting everything set up to Adam's uh, high standards of perfection uh, as a broadcaster. So here we are. No more settings that are wonky. Well, I mean, just we light, hope. Just lights and sound would have been uh, would have been nice. I was aiming for that. We, we seem to have got that. Well, looking... I think. Well, I think you've managed to actually get the shine off of our off of our our bonces. Speak for yourself. Yes. This is um, about the best I can do. If you're watching on Patreon, I was um, always an absolute nightmare when when on stage. Lighting directors hated me um, because. I, I just, I shine. The, well, you do shine. The, the, the general rule is, for cameras and things, yes. throw as much light on as you can from yeah. different angles and you know, the camera will lose what it wants to lose. But not with me, because I bounce it straight back. Yes, exactly. You Which are. Is, you soak up all the light. I do. Oh, no, actually, you yeah. reflect it. I do. You reflect I do. it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, I used to have to wear more there. makeup than the women when I was on stage. Yeah, well, that's another story, Adam. We it don't is. need to tell people about yeah. that. It wasn't even panto. Yes. Well, <laughs> every play is a panto. Uh, mm. Yeah, well, here we are. Uh, Partners in Crime. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're well uh, in these unsettled times, um, t- uh, to say the least. Uh, we had a, a long chat about uh, the state of the world last week. We're not going to do it so much this week, I don't think, because we. We are here to entertain, and goodness knows we uh, just have to turn on every other channel and uh, find out the horrors of the world at the moment. So we are going to really focus absolutely on our uh, the reason for our being, our raison d'être, uh, which is to tell you a little bit about uh, crime and thriller novels uh, and uh, audiobooks and TVs and films and theatre and what have you that might interest you. Uh, thanks to, and also thank as ever our dear friends at Kobo. Yeah, should we get that out of the way now? Yeah, get it out of the way. That we can move swiftly on. Let's get it done. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for no, them. No, we don't want to basically. appear ungrateful, but we want to crack on. Yeah, for some reason, they've decided that a fifth year on the airwaves is a good idea, and Christ knows why, but we are very grateful to Kobo, one of the world's largest ebook retailers, for being our sponsor. And as a listener to Partners in Crime, you're very lucky devils too, because you can get a massive 90% off of your first ebook purchase from Kobo. Just use the promo code CRIME22 at checkout. You don't need an e-reader or a special device, but they're very, very good. You can read on your phone or tablet if you wish. And if you've used that promo code already, then follow the link in the show notes and you can get 40% off of selected titles for life using a promo code PARTNERS22. Now, there's actually a couple of titles you might want to use those on because Kobo are very kindly sending their own recommendations to us now, which frankly saves us a job. Um, the first one that they have selected for us this week is uh, The Last Thing He Told Me by Laura Dave, which is a New York, uh, number one New York Times bestseller and a Reese's Book Club pick. It sold over a million copies, um, despite only coming out less than a year ago. It was a Richard and Judy book club pick as well, and it's soon to be a major TV series starring Jennifer Garner. See how this sounds. It was the last thing he told me. Protect her. Before Owen Michaels disappears, he manages to smuggle a note to his new wife, Hannah. Protect her, it says. Hannah knows exactly who Owen needs to protect. His teenage daughter, Bailey, who lost her mother tragically as a child and who wants absolutely nothing to do with her new stepmother. As her desperate calls to Owen go unanswered, his boss is arrested for fraud and the police start questioning her. Hannah realises that her husband isn't who he said he was and that Bailey might hold the key to discovering Owen's true identity and why he disappeared. Together, they set out to discover the truth, but as they start putting together the pieces of Owen's past, they soon realise their lives will never be the same again. That is one of their recommendations. They say it's been storming the charts, and readers should get ahead of the impending TV series. That's if you haven't already read it. 
Yes, if you haven't already read it, and it's going to be a TV series. I'll tell you what, the, the, the TV series, they're knocking the TV series out pretty swiftly these days. Catching it up. seems to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly on some channels. Even um, you're getting jobs. Well, even I'm getting <laughs> jobs, I must say. But they don't always work. I mean, the vast majority of them, well, I, I don't know, it's a question of taste, isn't it, like anything else. But uh, they don't always work. I've just mm. seen one which um, I, I fear didn't work, um, which was adapted from a... Uh, one of my favourite writers, uh, Robert Harris, and, uh, and adaptation is always very difficult, you know, because it's nothing like a book. You can be so much mm. subtler in the book on the whole. And and uh, this, I'm not going to mention it because I don't like overly criticising. But this particular book I had read, I read all his his stuff, and um, I very much enjoyed it. And you realise straight away that. So many of the things that he can do as a novelist, Robert Harris, he didn't adapt this particular one. Mm. So many things he can do as a, a novelist, the screenwriter struggles with um, because mm. of you know the different different demands of uh, of film production. But you and can't see a, a character's thoughts, no, for example, can no, you? you on the can't. Screen, so. But so what sometimes happens is 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 that you can see things coming a mile off, mm. and uh, they can't be hidden quite so well, and uh, uh, and getting the tone right. So I, I, you often hear things about successful writers writers who've had their books uh, adapted saying, I can't even look at it, I've had a terrible experience or whatever. Not always the case, uh, you know, as Mr Dexter knows, knew uh, with mm. um, his moors. He was absolutely always delighted with that. But uh, anyway, so, yeah, it doesn't always work, but it's good no. to see them hitting the television. But let's hope people have read them first. Yes. Well, uh, sorry. No, we, no, that's, 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 that's it. OK. That's Excellent. my rant. OK, well, um, the, the, the one I was recommending a moment ago there was The Last Thing He Told Me by Laura Dave, and their second pick of the week for you is from Catriona Wars, The Last House on Needless Street, which came out um, about a year ago as well, and she's got a new book, Sundial, out this month. But the book we're talking about, The Last House on Needless Streets, was one that Stephen King, of all people, raved about. He said, I haven't read anything this exciting since Gone Girl. Here's the blurb. This is a story of a murderer, a stolen child, revenge. This is the story of Ted, who lives with his young daughter Lauren and his cat Olivia in an ordinary house at the end of an ordinary street. All these things are true, and yet some of them are lies. An unspeakable secret binds the family together, and when a new neighbour moves in next door, the truth may destroy them all, because there's something buried in the dark forest at the end of Needless Street. But it's not what you think. So you can go and use your Kobo discount codes, perhaps, on those books, or, frankly, any other one you fancy. Well, that last one could have been a a synopsis on the back of one of your books. I have to say, you trendsetter you. I know. Fashion icon. Uh, well, steady. <laughs> steady. Well, yeah, OK, well, I've, I've got a... Um, uh, Alison Flood, wonderful Alison Flood, always ahead of the game uh, in The Guardian, has round up the recent thrillers. Uh, I say recent, uh, this is um, uh, a round-up she did last month, which I've caught up with, but I've caught up with it because I've been following um, advice... to for me, isn't it? <laughs> I've, I've just done two from a year ago, so... Oh, right. Uh, well, this is a, a, a book that... Um, has been recommended by several people, so I've been following it up. And uh, Alison Flood covered it in, in The Guardian in, uh, on the 22nd of February. It is a book called Notes on an Execution by Danya Kufkaka. Let's get this absolutely Try again. Danya Kufkafka. Lovely. I should be able to get the Kafka bit right, shouldn't I? Um, I might know why I shouldn't. I can imagine. Anyway, stop rambling doors. Carry on. Uh, from Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter to Brett Easton Ellis's Patrick Bateman, serial killers stalk the pages of fiction. Their actions and motivations drawing readers back again and again. But how many of us can remember the names of their victims? How many of us have imagined what their lives might have been if they hadn't crossed paths with their killers? Just as the true crime genre is starting to upend the narrative of the killer in Heli Romholds award winning The Five, the woman murdered by Jack the Ripper the women murdered by Jack the Ripper are given their own space on the page. So Danya Kukafka's notes on an execution looks at the women left behind as murderer Ansel Packer awaits his fate on death row. 
The clock is ticking towards Ansel's death as he plots his escape and gloats over the theory he will leave behind for the world to read. His crimes may be horrific, but Kafkaka isn't out to explore the origin story of the murderer. Instead, she tells us about his mother, Lavender, who was 17 when Ansel was born and subject to a world that slowly closed around her. In the Adiran... Oh, God. Why do I choose these ones with long words? Just do I, one set in Brighton I'm next I'm no time. good at the long words unless they rhyme. Adirondack Mountains. I don't even know where the Adirondack Mountains are. It must be America. Until the time came, Lavender did not understand what it meant to walk away from a thing she'd grown from her own insides. Well... As Akafkaka tells of Saffron Singh, the detective who has been on Ansel's trail for years, who knew him as a boy, saw what he was capable of then. As the world moves on from the three girls Ansel murdered, leaving the mystery unsolved. Notes on an Execution is Kafka's second novel after Girl in Snow, which I loved, which explored the death of a high school girl in Colorado. It is deeper, wiser, more painful than her debut, devastating in its impact and impossible to look away from. I can't remember the last time I finished a thriller in tears, not even sure by that point who my heart was hurting for. Well, that's uh, a fairly uh, good um, <laughs> recommendation, to, to, bad, to say the least, from Alison Flood, if you can excuse my uh, terrible pronunciations, but uh, regular listeners to Partners in Crime will be used to those. Um, so, yeah, that is a strong recommendation, I have to say, from Alison Flood, but she also goes on to recommend another book, which I want to cover a little later on, which is the new book by Sarah Vaughan, Reputation, um, the hugely successful best-selling author of Anatomy of a Scandal, has come up with another book called Reputation, which I'll talk about in a minute after mm. turning to my learned colleague for his thoughts. Well, I was going to um, suggest a little challenge for you for next week's episode. For me, yeah, personally. which oh. is that you learn how to say, um, you know, the, the, the Welsh town, the railway station. Oh. <laughs> Clan fair, something or other, gog or gog, that one. Yeah, so I can do the gog or gog. Yeah. I can even do the gog at the end of it. If you could have a little uh, little crack at learning that for next week, that's your homework. Well, I should be able to do a little bit. I should be able to do that all right, because I do have Welsh blood in me, which doesn't mean I can pronounce it. setting yourself up for a fool, or Yes, as a fool. Setting yourself up as a fool. Or for a fool. Yes. (laughs) One of those, yeah, one of those. Uh, Before you do go on to that next um, recommendation, I was going to um, throw a bit of news in. Actually, we're quite recommendation heavy at the moment. Um, I was reading something very interesting I didn't know in um, Forbes magazine, which of course I always read from cover to cover. Of course, with your income, you'd have to. (laughs) Yeah, something like that. Um, I'm going to read it out because I can't be bothered to paraphrase. It says, binging on crime fiction may not be your first choice of Easter activity, but it's high on the list for Norwegians. Tucking into oranges, enjoying the classic kviklunch... There you go. I see. Huh? Yes. Chocolate wafer. God, if you could see the look of smugness crossing his face. If you're on Patreon, you can. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, grabbing the last chance to ski or heading off for some sun are all popular Easter activities in Norway, but nothing beats the allure of a crime story. Because, it's a strange tradition this actually, hundreds of thousands of Norwegians indulge in crime fiction novels and Nordic noir TV and film every Easter, known as Easter crime or Pasca Krim. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. This is getting the, unbearable for me. <laughs> the tradition is just as well known within Norway as it is confusing to visitors. If you're Norwegian, please don't message in and tell me how poor that was. Forbes continue. <laughs> the latest books from literary heavyweights like Jørn Nisbø, the, uh, the famous Geordie writer, do battle <laughs> with the Easter crime collections of short stories in bookstore displays, displays across the country. British detective and police procedural shows are a favourite on TV, they say, although the popularity of Netflix, HBO Max and other global streaming services have given Norwegians a bounty of new international material to choose from. Now, the origins of Pasca Krim... Oh, God, you know, I think I'm falling in love with you the way you say that. Ah, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? Um, the origins go back almost 100 years because in 1923, which is very nearly 100 years, publisher... I remember uh, it well. <laughs> you're, just, you're just out of school. Um, the publisher Gillendahl took out a front-page newspaper advertisement promoting a new crime novel based on a train robbery on Norway's famous Bergen Line. So many people mistook the ad for a real story that the book succeeded beyond all expectations when the truth became known. And ever since then, crime stories have been a feature of Easter in Norway. Goodness gracious me. Who knew 
Mm. Norwegians, of course. Not Norwegians. Anyone who's been to Norway at Easter, maybe? Anyone who's travelled on the old Bergen line. Mm. Good Lord. Well, that's, yeah. uh, well, thank you for that. That's, uh, that's uh, my uh, Scandi knowledge increased 100% for this week. Um, mm. Yeah, well, it's, I was watching a documentary, a panorama. Uh, I don't know why I say it with a great surprise, because it's an extraordinarily fine programme. Um, and we talk about uh, real-life crime and things like that. And um, it was a, a half-hour documentary on Abranovich who, of course, if you're a Chelsea supporter, you'll probably uh, be mourning for the loss of him or rejoicing like uh, <laughs> the rest of us. have got nothing else to do. They're no. not allowed to go to the games now or buy shirts or anything. So, But obviously, in this period where uh, oligarchs are being analysed, uh, uh, thank goodness, at last, uh, people constantly said he got his money from sort of crime and various other things. What he actually did, I mean, this is going to be me simplifying it to the point of extinction, is... Um, he was uh, with Yeltsin. He was a sort of a, one of Yeltsin's favourites and worked with Putin and still does, allegedly. He bought most of Russia's main oil-producing companies and uh, put them all together. They're all separate and came together under one name. Um, and he bought them, which was the, the basis of his extraordinary fortune. But, extraordinary enough, he bought them, for two, all of them, for £250 million pounds. Uh, the money was given to him by the uh, Russian government. He then did a few little bits over a couple of years, and a few years later sold them for thirteen billion. But and this is where the crime comes in, of course. Well, certainly at the end, he sold them back to the Russian people and the Russian government. So basically, it was a huge fraud committed on the Russian people and Russian government, and a, a crime of su- such immense scale that it beggars belief. Well, I'm, I'm hoping Adrian Hobart can fill in next week when you inevitably get assassinated <laughs> in, on the streets of Hansel by our, our local Russian spies. Oh, yes, well, of which we said probably. Many, but do you know what I mean? I, well, that's... I mean, I was just flabbergasted mm. and I thought, I I didn't know this is news to me. Why wasn't this written about... I'm, you know, I'm talking about the British press apart from anything. If he's got 30 or billion pounds, that might be why. Yeah, well, ex- exactly. I thought... And I had read, and I had had a thing, but I never sort of. I did just didn't. No, I don't think most people knew well, about that, it. Is, apparently, it's that close to Putin that he. It's rumoured um, was the man that Putin went to when his his first term ended, as to um, to ask who should replace him, and Dmitry Medvedev was his uh, recommendation. Well, well. Anyway, there we are. I mean, so we goodness knows there are far worse crimes being committed in the Ukraine at the moment. But I mean, the, the origins of the wealth and obviously the huge amount of corruption that went on uh, are, are there. And you know, ordinary people, which I count myself very much as being very ordinary, uh, know very little about it. Maybe we didn't ask enough questions. I seem to. Be- no, obviously not. You know, the money was flooding into this country and the reputation of the, the UK for making these things uh, 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 possible and uh, allowing money to be cleaned and all the rest of it. I mean, it's absolutely appalling. Mm. But there we are. They call London the laundry. Apparently. The, the, London, the laundrette. The, the laundrette. The called it, yeah. Yeah, well, there we are. Uh, there we are. So that's real crime for you. Mm. And you can see that particular story dressed up by many famous uh, thriller writers and probably many have done it already because they're Far more in the know than I was, but there we go. Um, moving onwards now, uh, I mentioned um, uh, Sarah Vaughan, whose mm. uh, book has been uh, first book has been wonderfully uh, adapted. Um, uh, as uh, we all know, the anatomy of a scandal, um, and Sarah Vaughan's fifth book uh, is uh, out now and has just been bought. Uh, the rights for this were actually bought for a seven-figure sum. Uh, Adam is now spinning in his chair mm-hmm. at the very thought of that. Um, and uh, Sarah Vaughan's fifth novel is Uncannily Timely. Emma Webster, a labour backbencher and single mother, is campaigning on the topic of a revenge porn when her teenage daughter Flora runs into trouble of her own, as dark and gripping as you'd expect from the author of Anatomy of a Scandal. Uh, says uh, Alison Flood. And there's several articles about this uh, this week, and um, Sarah has been interviewed uh, several times. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at the one that's in The Guardian. Uh, as she publishes a thriller about a trolled MP uh, and Netflix adapts her bestseller, Anatomy of a Scandal, the former journalist talks about power, privilege, and her unnervingly prescient 
novels. Um, it was. A, a, I'll start into this. Sarah Vaughan has Boris Johnson to thank, at least in part, for the genesis of her best-selling thriller, Anatomy of a Scandal. The former Guardian reporter was on call on a Sunday in November 2004, the day after Johnson had been sacked from the Conservative front bench because he'd lied about having an affair with Petronella Wyatt, and Johnson had telephoned her about the story. It was the fact that he had no compunction in lying that struck me, says Vaughan. There was a lot of flummery and flannel, lots of chuntering and all chaps togetherness about it. Chuntering. I, mean, I love chuntering. I just I was just had a review of something I've done where mm. it says Robert Dawes chunters on. Uh, it was positive, <laughs> actually. Uh, um, uh, very nice, Christopher Stevens. Mm. Uh, but uh, yes, ch- ch- chunter. I think it means to monot- monotonously go on. Well, sounds like a nineteen seventies TV series. Yeah. Doesn't well, it? anyone Rob- listen- Robert Dawes chunters on. Yeah. Well, that's anyone listening to any regular listener to Partners in Crime will know that I chunter away regularly, or as regularly as I can ima- I can uh, manage. He was writing a lot for the Telegraph. This is Johnson here. So there was a definite sense that we were hacks together who wouldn't stitch each other up. But yes, he confirmed the story was true and didn't seem to express any remorse. It was the first time I was aware of a public figure admitting to lying and not seeming to be bothered by it. And as we know, those who have read it, and it's a superb book, uh, Anatomy of a Scandal, um, Sarah Vaughan really does uh, explore that very, very well. And her new book, Anatomy, uh, as I say, is out, which is an exploration of consent and privilege. Uh, which uh, apparently is uh, uncannily timely, uh, I should say so. Uh, Vaughan's uh, forthcoming novel, Reputation, might be even more so than her previous. It opens with a body at the bottom of the stairs, that, uh, that of a tabloid journalist, and goes on to explore how MP Emma Webster ended up standing over the corpse. Webster is a Labour backbencher and single mother who is relentlessly trolled when she starts a campaign against revenge porn. She tries to keep the worst of it from her teenage daughter Flora, but Flora has social problems of her own. And Emma, the name, uh, and Emma, the name, uh, a nod of to John Webster's revenge tragedy about reputation in the Duchess of Malfi. Oh, I didn't know that. I know the Duchess of Malfi. Uh, finds her Personally. spiralling out. No, not, oh, I haven't seen her for ages. I was supposed to be going round to tea last <laughs> summer, but didn't make it. What is she and what is Flora without their reputation? Vaughan details chillingly the steps Emma takes to keep herself safe. The bottle of water on the desk in her constituency in case of an acid attack. The chair placed just so to deflect potential attackers. The bag checks for knives. The abusive tweets. The anonymous texts. The terror of cycling home at night alone. The germ of the novel was an article Vaughan read about Labour MP Jess Phillips, who said she had multiple extra locks on her front door and a panic room in her constituency office. Wow. Well, I'm mm. going to stop there because... I don't want to give too much of uh, it away, but I mean it's a spot-on trend. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, this uh, the fact that public figures are are uh, live in fear and danger not only for themselves but for their for their loved ones and families. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that uh, the new book I think is uh, an absolute must-read. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've read the first one, read it again. Uh, and if you haven't, get both on Kobo. Well, that leads very nicely into something I was going to talk about, which was a news story in the Irish Times this week um, about why there are so many Irish women crime writers. I don't think it's a complaint by any stretch of imagination. Um, It's an article by Louise Phillips, and she says that the rise of successful Irish crime writers has become more and more evident with four or five of the six writers shortlisted for the best Irish crime novel of the year in consecutive years being female, alongside growing success on the international stage. She says, I began to dig a little deeper, and it wasn't long before other reasons surfaced. Started with my own journey growing up. She says she grew up in an island where women had far fewer rights than they have today. Coupled with the stranglehold of the Catholic Church, especially the dark cloak it placed over women in society, was undeniably cruel, often feeding into the ideology of women being sinners rather than victims. She says, I also grew up in an island where domestic abuse, still prevalent today, might be seen as a husband's right, and if not for the most part, people looked away. I grew up in an island, she says, where women were forced to leave their careers after marriage and where women had little political representation. Even their rights over the family home held no security. The use of contraceptives was illegal too, as was the right to choose. And if you happen to marry a man who abused you, well, you made your bed, so you better lie in it. Louise Phillips continues in the Irish Times, the constraints imposed on women's lives not only participate... 
I'll have another run at that. The constraints imposed on women's lives not only precipitated gender discrimination, but violence too, all within an inflamed and misogynistic society. She says... I grew up and live in an island where women walk a very different path to many men. And if crime fiction acts as a mirror on society and its cultural norms, then there are many reasons why my might. There are many reasons why my writing tends to explore darker issues and why female voices are currently being heard loud and clear. That's an excellent article. Um, I've very much just picked and chosen some bits out of that, but I would highly recommend. Uh, looking at our show notes, clicking on the link to that and reading it. And she has got a new book out now as well, Louise Phillips, They All Lied, which came out on March the 3rd. What a fascinating theory. Mm. Sounds very Makes convincing. a lot of sense, actually. Yes, it does. Very convincing. Uh, I was just going to say, if you try using the word, uh, pronouncing the word precipitate with a, a Norwegian accent, it usually works much better. Precipitation. Yes, you see, perfect. Mm. Just... Sliding off a log. I think there's precipitation outside today, unfortunately, which is... Um, precipitation? Mm. Dear old precipitation. There's always a lot of precipitation. No, nowhere near as much precipitation uh, in our part of the world as there are in, La- in Lancashire. Oh, God, I've, I ne- I've never been to Manchester <clears throat> without it raining, I don't think. Well, I, I have. I've actually known su- uh, sunshine in, in Manchester, but not for very long, of course. Sunshine. <clears throat> yes, but Lancashire, no. I mean, beautiful, beautiful, wonderful county that it is. It is it is well wet. I, I, uh, <laughs> As Michael Fish used to say. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Well, I've run out of things to say now. Have you? Well, I've... That's encouraging, because so have I. Lots and lots of words that I find difficult to... Um, we should do a vocal warm-up before each show, shouldn't we? No. Ha, 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 ha. Peter no. Piper picked a peck of pickle pepper from the pickle pepper tree. That'd be absolutely perfect. Well, and then we would absolutely be on it, mm. as opposed to ever so slightly off it. Talking about being on it... Yes. I am quite tired today, and I will tell you why, uh-huh. in Partners in Crime, Arsenic and Old Lace, because I think a cliffhanger means I can um, do some flogging, because um, our patrons get early access to every episode of Partners in Crime. They also get to watch it in full HD and access to Partners in Crime, Arsenic and Old Lace, our extra end-of-show show, after-show show, show type thing that we do each week. You'll get a shout-out on the show in the week you join, and access to lots more... Um, so do check out the link in the show notes for that and see if you uh, might fancy helping to support Partners in Crime. You also get a free book every month, which this month is The Last Amen by C.C. Jameson, which is normally three ninety nine and is yours free as a patron. So do check out the link to that in the show notes. And if you're a patron, you can get a hold of it. What more could you possibly want? There we go. I We're going to go know. and record Arsenic and Old Lace now. Good. And, and I'll uh, explain why I'm so tired. Exactly. Well, I mean, you can have a little nap in between recording no, really that if you want. Just, just, yeah, go on, just 40 winks. Just, just, just relax. Put your feet up. Actually, Pretty much looking all down I got there, last night. What, what uh, listeners can't see, uh, even ones looking at it because it's under the desk, <laughs> is that uh, Adam has a, a, a footstool. Mm. Uh, and it is called the hog. Mm. It's called hedging your feet. Um, and it's called the hog, I presume, Adam, and please tell me. It's something my wife bought when she was pregnant, okay. essentially, to roll her back on and things like that. It's become my footrest. Interesting. Uh, but it's, it's full of sort of spikes that massage your feet while you're actually broadcasting. If I move my feet while I'm broadcasting, If you yeah. move your feet while you, you can, like can, that. you can just give it to... Oh, yes. I try yes. not to because my chair starts creaking. Yes. Well, it does. Well, look, absolutely. Well, it looks very useful, um, and I'm very, very glad I haven't got one. Right, so... I'll put a picture in Patreon. The, yes, that? That's a very good yes. idea. Adam's Hog. Another reason to sign up. What more could you want? Cheerio, then. See you next week. To Bye. Now. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Fache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, perfected. Perfected.